Hi everyone, I'm Nicola Canzano, and I'm honored to have been asked to speak with you all as part of the inaugural International Conference for Historical Improvisation this year. It's been an absolute privilege to look through all of your excellent submissions, and I want to congratulate all of you who applied. Uh, the quantity and the quality of your work makes me so optimistic about the future of improvisation, about the future of music education, historical composition, and I really can't wait to chat with you all about everything you've been thinking about and everything you've been working on. Uh, right now, I'm going to give a talk about some things that I think are not often discussed, which, uh, which are tactics for generating melodious and rhetorically uh, cogent lines. This can be an extremely complicated, if not contentious, and, and certainly nebulous topic. So I'm going to show you essentially one technique, which is extremely general, show you some examples, and then we will write a few exposition together to hammer it home. And I will make mention of some other potentially helpful things I've, I've observed along the way, and, and uh, I'll give you some tips for fugue writing also and things like that. So I think it will be really clear how these ideas are helpful for improvisation, but I'm, I'm going to examine them in the context of historical composition so that we can be a bit more thorough about it and not have to deal with all of the sort of survival mode shortcuts of improvisation. The goal of this short talk in concrete is to give you some strategies for rhetorical cogency and to convince you of the utility and importance of composition as an improvisation practice. As a side note, I find from experience that most of the students I've had who tend to have an easy time improvising tend to be those who have experience composing it. It's a pretty clear pattern that I've noticed. So I, I really think you, you cannot improvise without composing. So it's a really important activity to do. It gives you the space to think about all, these, um, all of these things, and they do bleed into your improvisations in a, in a really helpful way. So the goal is, again, to give you strategies for rhetorical cogency and to convince you that this is an important thing to do. As a fair warning, the latter half of this talk will assume a knowledge of counterpoint and at least a basic idea of how fugues are put together. So, all right, let's start by explaining this technique for melodic generation, which we'll call spinning forward. All right, so what is this thing, spinning forward? Um, first, I have to have a huge disclaimer about why I'm calling it this. Um, I'm calling it spinning forward because it's related to um, uh, a term that's already made it into the lexicon called Fortspinnung, which roughly means spinning out. And this is a technique from music theory where a short idea, previously part of a larger idea, or at least usually so, is repeated in closer succession to itself or otherwise developed quickly within a phrase, kind of like a, like a kind of melodic stretto. There are a lot of examples on this online, which it cannot hurt to refamiliarize yourself with. Um, spinning forward, I've called it not because I've invented or discovered anything, but because it's related to this idea and because I'm, I'm quite frankly ignorant of the music theoretic literature and find it less time consuming to reinvent wheels than to sift through the enormous pile of mostly unhelpful, um, well, literature that, that is music theory research. Uh, in the end, I think the goal of these papers is usually to analyze rather than to instruct so I can feel moderately assured that I'm not sidestepping any academic rigor by, um, by you know, creating a proprietary name for this thing temporarily, nor, nor am I crushing anyone's toes here because I, I really am not purporting to, um, you know, be, be inventing or, or, or discovering anything at all. Um, rather, I'm confident that these ideas can be helpful to those who are curious about historical improvisation and composition, and so while I will try whenever possible to fit them into the existing paradigm, they are really informed by my experience teaching and working with this um, in composing, improvising music, and seeing what helps for my own students. So the priority will always be to give practical tools to earnest learners um, rather than to um, be a uh, card-carrying member of, of academia here. All right, all right, so disclaimer over. So what is this thing spinning forward? So like I've written here, it's a method for continuing a line wherein a new phrase begins first with a reference to material from the end of the previous phrase. And so you can see this little, this little pictorial example I gave down here, and I'll give you a bunch of music examples in just a second. But if these are, are phrases, right, and, and these spaces in between them are sort of just agreed upon points of rest or punctuation, they don't even have to be complete, you know, phrases with a cadence or anything like that. They just have to be ideas that, are, that, are, that we agree are separated in time. And, and notice that the first shape, and I, and I mean that, you know, sort of literally, right, because we can, we can graph melody on, on rough axes of shape and rhythm. The shapes that we use are the same at the ends of one phrase and the beginning of the next, right? These are both squares and, 
and this is both a circle, right? Okay, so maybe this maybe this makes a whole lot of sense to some of you. Maybe it's it's not so clear. So let's 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 put these ideas to music and see. Let's see if we can't find a bunch of examples to show you what I I really mean. Okay, so this first example is Mozart's twenty fourth piano concerto. Let's first just listen. This recording is um, Malcolm Bilson um, and the English Baroque soloists, which is conducted by uh, John Elliott Gardner. So it's just really this opening phrase. That's the example. I know it bleeds over into the next page here, but see how, so here's really the first main thing, right? There's a little pause here. So that's the first thing we hear as one idea. Maybe I'll make this a little clearer. Then he takes this bit. Okay, he decorates it a tiny bit with an extra uh, quarter note in there. But he basically takes this and puts it there, adding a little pickup. He does this again. Okay, and then he takes an even shorter piece and and develops that for a quick second before returning to what amounts to this type of idea with the chromatic rising thing, just as a mirror image, and tying the thing off with a cadence. All right, so let's look at another example. All right, this is the second movement of BWV 1016, the violin sonata in E major, and I'm going to play you a really marvelous recording that I'm sorry we can't listen to the whole thing. Uh, this is Menno van Delft and uh, Shunsuke Sato. Um, this is available on YouTube as part of the Netherlands Bach Society recordings. So let's listen to just a little bit of it. Alright, that's all we need um, for now. Um, so he has these two ideas that are basically the same thing. All right, and these, these, these circles are not exact, they're beginning and ending points, but, but almost. Uh, and this notice, he adds just a single note to this. So this is sort of like, you know, if I were to give these little symbols, you know, like we can call this sort of alpha and, and just a tiny little um, modification of it, right? But then he runs with the piece that he modified, right? And he uses that as a new thing. So he takes just the end bit of this and he runs with it. Right? So it's, it's this idea of taking the last little bit of what you heard and then continuing on by um, by basically developing that a little further and letting it evolve into its own thing, right? And sort of spin off, right? Or spin forward, as we're calling it. Um, and this whole idea of, of repeating an idea that has a... and then decorating it, and then using the decorated bit as a new thing to continue on is, is something that happens all the time. And I'll just make one more mention of something... Well, maybe a couple things that Bach does. I'm going to really try to not get carried away. You know, this is the third time I'm recording this presentation because the last two ended up to be an hour. I just can't help myself, but I'll, I'll be really quick. Um, notice that this counter subject here, I mean, this is a fugue, technically. Uh, this counter subject here um, is, quite mo is quite rhythmically distinct from the thing that it's accompanying, or what, what we'll call the subject. And this is a good idea in general for counter subjects, and this will come back later um, when we're going to write our fugue together. The other nice thing that he does, which I can point out to you right now, is that at the end of this, this long phrase, which basically opens the piece, which ends here in B major, he reintroduces material from, uh, from before, that he had been developing something else, right? So uh, he's, he's going on with all of, with all of this stuff, which is actually new and came out of this thing, right? And then at the very end, he's reintroducing this, right? Which we've heard over here. So this is nice. Basically, he, you know, you have some shapes and you go on developing them, you know. Uh, and then at the very end, you know, you can bring back maybe a little piece of the beginning. 
maybe you modify it slightly or something like that. So, so these are just some some ideas you see that are pretty general and and lead to convincing rhetorical constructions. Okay, let's look at one more example. Okay, this final example is within the context of a few, which is what we do, what we'll be doing in just a moment. Uh, this is one of my, my favorite uh, pieces of music, um, and this is a recording which is not my favorite, which is played by Pierre Hontai as part of the same series, this Netherlands Bach. Uh, oh, actually, it's not, sorry, it's uh, Felicis Cantus Bach, right, a similar series on YouTube. So here's Pierre Hontai playing the harpsichord like a jackhammer. Sorry, we can't listen to the whole thing, but I'm also not so sorry. Um, uh, anyway, all right, I'm gonna just, I'm not gonna say anything about the performance. Um, so this one is, I think, very clear cut, right? So he has these two ideas that are repeated in succession. No, these aren't exactly the same shape, right? These intervals don't match up. They're not. It's not. It's not precise. It's not a transposition, right? But we still see these two shapes as 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 basically identical and paired. Okay, so yada di da dum fim fi dum fi di 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 di. This little end bit basically results as a decoration, all right, of this figure. Yum bi dum fi di 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 dum fi di dum fi di 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 di. Yeah, and then it's this little this little bit. So this arose as a decoration, that gets that gets spun forward. And this gesture gets repeated. All the while, however, we have this, you know, this new subject entered. So this has its own melodic logic entirely. It, it's spinning itself out, basically irrespective of what's going on above it. And it's this kind of, this kind of effect of a of 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 a simultaneous melodic miracle that I think makes a good fugue. That everything makes sense as a whole, but also separately. You know, and I think in keyboard music you get a bit of a pass. Um, you know, because it's hard to, to do this all the time with, with the limitations of keeping everything so close together. But Bach does a pretty great job in, in, this, uh, in this particular movement. So, I mean, the, the same thing actually will, will keep happening here, right? This idea spins, you know, spins forward and eventually becomes this thing, which then turns into a sequence that's, re that's returned to over and over again over the course of the piece, right? And this logic continues through. Again, these, these melodies are just based off of the things that came immediately before here in the bass. Right, and yet we have new entrances happening on top of them. Okay, so let's see if we can't try to do this ourselves. And we're going to take a a, a, a multi-step approach where we're first going to create sort of a a um, scaffolding for ourselves in a smaller variety of note values, maybe just quarters and halves and holes. Uh, and then we can create a harmonic plan for ourselves and maybe eke out some stretto opportunities and things like that. And then um, we'll decorate our subject scaffolding and use melodic considerations to kind of fill in things like the counter subject and the accompaniment to entries and um, see how we can't structure our exposition together using this whole principle of, of spinning forward. And we'll mention some other ways for, for melodies to evolve along the way and some things about um, fugal composition that don't get that don't often get talked about. All right, so let, let's let's write this fugue together. All right, so we're going to try to write a fugue together here that uses this whole technique of, of spinning forward to try to generate lines. And of course, we can be informed by our uh, harmonic and, and, and gestural duties um, in writing fugues. You know, the, the counter subject has to harmonize the, the subject well. There can't be any counterpoint errors. These entrances need to go where they need to go. And so we can use all of these things to triangulate the best solution to the problem of what to write next. Okay, so this precise step of scaffolding is not... Um, strictly related to what we've been talking about, but I think since we're writing a fugue together, I might as well show you a very helpful step to do it, um, which is basically to create a nice little harmonic map for yourself first and figure out where where your decisions are going to be most affected by um, rhetorical freedoms that you have. All right, so I'll show you what I mean. The other thing that this is really useful for is basically to find 
opportunities for stretto and augmentation and things like that. I, I will usually skip this step, writing fugues, but if I know I want it to be like a showstopper, you know, I want I want it to be, be able to do it backwards and upside down and, and, you know, diminuted and augmented and, you know, strettoed in eight different ways, then I will do this step because it's necessary for finding those contrapuntal tricks. And, and I'll show you that really, really quickly in, um, in a second. Um, for now, let me just sort of run you through why I've chosen the things I've chosen really quickly. So this subject, uh, essentially, if I want to, if I want to be even more general with it, really just sort of does this, and it decorates a cadence pattern that basically does that. Okay, in in the um, in the melody, at least the bass would be like a one four five one or something like that. And it's good that your fugue subject harmonizes a cadence, or at least contains the harmonization of a cadence. Okay, and, and, I, and there are some reasons that I go into for that in some videos that I made on fugue improvisation where I give some uh, instructions for choosing a good subject. Okay, I'll also mention that this fugue subject is, is three bars long, which is nice because usually we expect hypermeasure, the, basically the length of, of phrases and statements, to be in powers of two. So when the fugue subject is something like three or five or one and a half or something like that, it creates this mismatch between where we think the phrase ends and where we know the subject ends, which creates a nice feeling of, of, of rhetorical um, propulsion forward, because the, it also creates a, a nice independence of parts, yeah? because we are even more aware of where these things are, are ending and, and beginning, um, and, and we're also aware of where we would like them to. Yeah, okay, but for now, I'm basically just, I have a subject that I know will work later that is, that is self-similar, all right? And, um, and I'm just writing down the answer. Don't have to worry about tonal or, or real for this one. Uh, and I'm just sort of trying to maximize thirds and sixths here in my counter subject. I don't care at all about melodic considerations yet. The fact that this is like a quasi imitation or something like that, I don't mind at all because I haven't decorated this subject. And so once I decorate it, I'm gonna have access to a whole different world of shapes and things like that that I can use my, my technique of, of spinning forward on. For now, I'm just trying to give myself a harmonic map for that to be informed by. Yeah, so I'm basically just trying to maximize uh, thirds and sixths when, when I have my counter subject and answer playing. And I want to make sure that I'm not disobeying the fundamental cadence that this is based on, right? So I can do, uh, um, and this is essentially, oh, this is white now. This is essentially something like this, right? So I think that's clear. With the introduction of B natural here, it's clear that I mean uh, G major. Uh, so it's an important pivot point to show that we've moved into five. So I haven't, I, I have lots of thirds and sixths. I don't have any, uh, I don't, I'm not breaking any rules. Um, things are clear. Uh, so this works out just fine. And this little, this is just a little episode to get us back to F major. Who knows what I'll actually do or if I'll actually need it. This is just scaffolding to kind of show that the next place I need to enter is over here. Okay, and now, like I said, I'm going to have some different shapes in here. So who knows what's going to go up here? I really kind of want to wait to see how I decorate this to see how exactly this is going to proceed gesturally. Harmonically, I, I can just fill something in pretty simply for now. You know, or something like this. I'll be really quick about it. Okay. So the reason we've done this, again, is to give ourselves a nice harmonic map over which to make these decisions of gestural relationships, right? First, let me show you the other really cool thing that this helps us do. So if I work in small note values like this first, things that are simple that don't have a complicated variety of rhythms, then it's easier for me to see imitation opportunities. Okay, and I've just given you two examples. There are plenty with this one. Um, you know, if I really want this thing to work in augmentation or diminution or inversion or retrograde or stretto, you know, this is a necessary step. 
And there's, there's a whole mathematics that's involved for this that basically amounts to the interval content of a certain idea that you would like to do counterpoint transformation with. And that's beyond the scope of this video. Okay, but, but even without knowing those tricks, you can kind of see, right, from these small note values, things that might work. Okay, and you can use this as a little brainstorm place, um, basically to write these down. And then you want to you wanna use these later in your development, right? You don't want to, you know, you don't want to go nuts with the grand finale of the fireworks show right at the beginning. You know, you want to lead up to it. So you find all of these things. I mean, here I found that this subject works works with itself at the fourth above at the interval of, of a bar and, and at the fifth above at the interval of a half bar, right? Uh, I might notice things like, oh, I recognize this as the top of a down four, up five, you know, sequence. Maybe I want to harmonize it with that. So I basically just have a, a brainstorm session, right, with, 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 with the subject. And I can, in fact, use this to devise subjects that are self-similar and then extract a longer bit out of it to use as an, as an exposition and to treat it like a fugue rather than a canon. Okay, so it's just a, a helpful little thing that one can do. All right, so now let's actually dress this fugue subject up and see how we can't make decisions about what to write next, given this whole technique of, of spinning forward and trying to be true to our harmonic map. Okay, so I've come up with a decorated version of my fugue subject. Recall that the original was here in magenta. Yum ba da dim bi da dum bi da dum, and the decoration is yum bum bi ba bi di dim bum bi dum ba ya da dum bi di di dum bi ya di 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 di. Totally different set of of shapes and rhythms, right? So the way that we can continue this, I mean, you know, we have things to think about now rather than just trying to be harmonically correct. So I, I've just tried to tried to be literal about this strategy, right? So I've just taken this piece, the last thing I've heard, and I've tried to do that. Right? And notice that the shape isn't exactly the same, right? I didn't do yada because that doesn't really quite work with the subject. But I've made sure that the general shapes are the same, even though the intervals aren't, right? These, these both move up and this moves down. Okay. And this guy comes in, and I could choose to continue this line forward. All right, maybe I, I will reach a D or something like that, because the fact that I have this 5-1 here, this is going to sound like a stopping point, all right, which is quite uncommon, by the way, in fugues. And usually we want sort of thing, the lines to, to continue, all right? But I, I'm really more concerned here with sort of independent logic of parts, thing, thing, things that work and will be satisfying contrapuntally. So while this is, I think, unconventional, I think it's, it's perfectly appropriate. By the way, I, I am, I'm using my own thoughts here, not because I think I'm so great and because this is the best way to do it and because, you know, I'm, I'm so great at this, but, but because I can, I feel like I'm going to be the most helpful to you rather than trying to guess what Bach is thinking and analyze a piece of his, which has been done in, in you know, a ton. Um, I can be a hundred percent certain what the composer is thinking throughout this process. So I, I can really reveal to you my logic and give you my reasoning and, and you can take it or leave it. Um, all right, so I'm just trying to employ this whole spinning forward thing here. I'm just taking this guy, piecing it together, and I'm, I'm basically just cadencing with this one part. So we have a really nice melodic part that works with this entrance and, and really is working on a different logic and scale. I mean, it's a nice melody by itself, and this is what we really want to accomplish in all the parts. Um, notice also, like I said before, we really want the counter subject to be unique, which is part of the reason why you don't see this whole spinning forward thing that often for counter subjects, because generally we don't want the subject and the counter subject to share material, because we would like them to be um, unique and, at the very least, rhythmically complementary. Yeah, but this isn't really creating any problems. It's creating a nice melody. It's quite separate from this at first, and then I go into something quite different here, which is rhythmically uh, and gesturally unique. However, it still, still sounds like a continuation. I'm still basically using this, this technique here. These guys are the same. And in fact, uh, this shape, um, well, I, I, I can't waste time. So I've chosen the shapes of this counter subject based on what came before and based on based on what I've written in magenta here, which, and if you can go back and check, this is a decoration of what I had written in my scaffolding. This here I've actually changed. I wanted to spin this out a little more, and it turns out because I've begun my subject on five now, 
I actually don't need to get exactly back to F major since the first note of my uh, fugue subject entering is C. So I can have a C major chord at the beginning there. In fact, I, it's preferable. If I had F, then this would technically be a 6-4, which is technically not right. Right? So I have this one episode, this one bar episode, which is spinning off this same little bit before my bass enters. And now I have to decide basically what goes over this bass entrance. Okay, so I know I've skipped ahead here a bit, but I can be very careful about explaining what I've done. So recall that we left off with this entrance, and all of this here was, was blank. Okay, so the last decision I made was what to put over here, and I'll talk about how I decided this too. So like I said, this, these gestures are just based off of the last thing I heard here. So starting from here, um, yeah, so it's quite clear how, how, how these things are related. Okay, I've really just done the same thing with, with this subject um, over here. Okay. And by the way, this, I mean, I, I'm sort of taking this logic to a bit of an extreme, and, and you know, for a good reason, I'm trying to show you how, how one can use it. But of course, this is not the only way to make the melodic decisions, and, and of course, to try to do this all the time with everything will lead to catastrophes. So of course, there are, there are other, other sort of general melodic principles that, that one um, can keep in mind, and I, this is probably a good time to mention them. Um, basically... This is this is really beyond the, the scope of this and requires books probably to discuss and is a really interesting thing by the way good melody because it seems to have um, some relationships to um, you know neuroscience and linguistics and all of this and then sort of what it means to be human and all that and I won't I won't um, I, I won't be too discursive but suffice it to say that that basically I, in my experience the things that that our ears seem to be most sensitive to in melody is rhythm and the Location of stopping points, basically. So, I can translate into things that you generally don't want to do. Basically, if you use the same rhythm over and over again, even if you are changing your shape, our brains are going to pair those things together. Okay, so you want to proceed in a in an organized fashion when you're dealing with things like rhythm and 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 stoppages. Okay, similarly, if we always stop on the same note. Right when we end our phrase, you know, <laughs> excuse me, it's it's going to sound like we're saying the same thing over and over. Okay, so we want to be logical about where things end, and we would like for um, rhythms to not get overused, or at least to be cautious of how we are using rhythms. So it's a safe bet. To activate different registers and to use sort of different rhythms that um, complement the other parts, right? So that's basically the logic that we went by over here, which we'll get back to in a second, right? So for now, I basically the first thing I decided was was what to put up here. Of course, I can just write this guy all the way to here because we know what the subject is. So how did I, I decide to put these notes? Well, hidden in magenta here is my scaffolding, which of course I was free to ignore, but worked quite well. And I'm going to try to just spin it forward. So I started with this little gesture here. So then I just took a smaller piece and I just developed it into something different. So starting here. It's become something else, and it sounds quite natural, because I, I was careful about, about the rhythms and the points of stopping, and I was clear to connect these things. Yeah, and I, and I, had, and I had an idea of sort of um, what it should drape over, because I, I did the work of, of figuring out harmonically simple and effective uh, accompaniments that I could sort of dress it up over. Okay. Now, I, I, I can sort of keep, just keep it simple and do what I did in magenta here at first and see how that works. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm talking too much. And then I can see what it needs. I mean, so for example, here I created parallel octaves, right? Which will happen from time to time. You know, I mean, all the things that work with your skeleton aren't necessarily going to work once you put stuff in the cracks, but most of it still will. And it's just, and it's just a matter of 
fixing these small things rather than trying to figure it out from a from a complicated lump at the beginning. So it's another reason why this is, is helpful. But this created parallel octaves if I just did it as it was. So I created this little intervening tone here. And rhythmically that works out. One strategy you can always employ is to basically check on these things separately. I, I will, when I compose very often, I will just play something as a simple continuo with skeletons. Um, so I can check the harmony uh, and sort of the pacing. And I will also check just the rhythm by itself. So I, I can start from here. And you, you might think this is silly, but it's, it's, it's very easy to come up with, ri with rhythms that don't work. I mean, like, you know, it's quite easy to be totally nonsensical with this. All right, so I can check on these things. So th these are how I've made these decisions. I've used the scaffolding. I've used the idea of spinning forward. And I've used some, some basic guidelines for melody, which is that I don't really want to. Rather, I have to be careful about which rhythms I reuse and, and where uh, I've, I've, I've made points of, of stoppage, both within, both within the beat and the phrase and, and which pitch. Right? Otherwise, I'm just following my scaffolding. So the next place that I'm led to is over here. And I would really like to actually, you know, do a real Forchbindung rather than a spin forward and really take this little last bit and actually make a nice little sequence out of it. And that's what I've done. And I've just allowed these parts to basically keep doing what they were doing with the most simple harmonization, which is a falling 7-6. I could have done a different sequence here. I could have entered again, or I could have, in fact, just cadenced after this, okay, and spun this out into some different cadence pattern, you know, and, and maybe I would use the you know, what that spun out into as the springboard for some type of B theme or something like that. Um, but I'm just going to cadence this with a, with a fall, or a, or a sequence this with a falling 7-6. And these parts I've, I've sort of just let do what they were doing. If you can't do the same thing, a mirror image is a pretty good second thing. So that's what this is. Yadadam, fididim, bididim, bididi, yadadam. Slight decoration of what came before. Yadididididam. All right. These match up. Okay, this guy is just Im imitation. And I can always check that it that it doesn't sound too a melodious. So uh, let's start from here. Yum da 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 di da di da dum bum bi di 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 fi di di fi di 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 da dum. I mean, it's not sing songy, right? Um, it's not the most melodious thing, but it's certainly not a melodious or strange or um, nonsensical, right? So I'm just trying to allow these parts to fulfill the own logic that they want to fulfill, all the while trying to make this fugue work. All right. The last thing I have here is this little half cadence, which was the result of my sequence, and which sets us up really well for a strong final cadence, which is what I decided to do. And like I mentioned with the Bach E major sonata, right, I've hearkened back to stuff that I haven't in a while, the beginning of the fugue subject. I've sort of been developing and playing with the end of it and using that to generate new material and what have you. Um, and then I'm, I, I partially state it and let it and, and sort of spin it forward itself a little bit, right? This shape is taken from there, just like it would continue otherwise, but I've sort of scrunched this rhythm forward a bit into a cadence. Okay, and it's this kind of gestural self-similarity, this type of, you know, letting things develop and then circling back and returning to things that we've heard um, that I think creates really rhetorically tight music um, and, and which I think is clear how it can be used as a tactic in improvisation to continue. You take the last thing you heard and you try to make it into a new thing. All right, so I, I really hope that this was um, somewhat helpful for you all. All right, so the last thing to do is listen to this thing really quickly, just for the really sharp ones out there who are, are um, who, who might take issue with this. There's some sort of fifths here. Um, I don't know. I, I, we can argue about whether this counts with the rest or not, but in either case, the, the fix is really simple. You can just bring this up an octave if you really care that much. All right, okay, so now that that's taken care of, let's actually listen to this thing.
Thanks everyone for listening.